uh, in, at least in Latin America. We have been showing Latin American architects and also having um, a constant relationship with uh, American universities that want to visit Mexico, and we provide them, uh, we, we basically facilitate appointments with the architects and designers, and we also do exhibitions there, and a little bit of everything. It's about architect, design, urbanism, sometimes a street theater, so it's a, it's a, it's an, it has been a very nice platform. And it has given me also the opportunity to know a little bit, at least a Mexican architecture and design a scene, and partially, of course, Latin American architecture and design a scene. So the reason why I decided to, the group of women that we have here is very heterogeneous. I think they're coming from different fields and from different expertises. Um, the reason why I wanted to put the, all of them together is uh, basically because I think the way how they work, they work in a very interdisciplinary way, I think. And this is not that easy inside the respective disciplines, like approach their own way of doing things from different point of view and, and, and to work always in collaboration with other agents. And also, other thing that for me was very important when I put them together is the tremendous social impact that their work has, even more or beyond uh, uh, commercial success. So I think that's why I, I wanted to invite, like for instance, somebody like Ingrid and Carla, Ingrid Moye and Carla Fernandez as a practitioner. Ingrid is an architect and Carla is a um, fashion designer, but also a cultural historian. And also I thought it was very interesting to invite uh, um, Leticia, um, because Leticia is also part of this uh, initiative, a governmental initiative called el Laboratorio para la Ciudad, City Lab, no? Uh, that is also is, is, is also a pioneer on, on their kind, at least in Latin America also. And they work a lot with the with the citizens to develop different things for, for the city. So we will talk about that uh, um, in more like deep. And also, uh, I thought it was also important to have somebody like Alison because it's also the only person from this other side. Uh, I will now briefly read about who is who, but um, she was, she's the one that can bring also her knowledge and how, in your case, like Californian uh, business has been also establishing in Mexico for the, for the past few years. So I'm going to um, read very briefly their own, I mean, like, like little bios from each one, and after we will engage in a conversation between us. And um, I think we can, I mean, we, have a, we can have a dialogue, and at the same time, we will open for questions, because I think Let's do it in a kind of organic way and see how it uh, how it's happened. So Ingrid Moye is Moye or Moye? I always like Moye. Moye. I know because the <laughs> accent is not there, so I was like no problem. <laughs> so Ingrid Moye co-founded the Mexico City Berlin-based architectural firm Seller and Moye in 2013, targeting work that possibly impacts public life. Seller and Moye focused on cultural and social projects ranging in a scale from objects and artworks to large buildings and master plans, and it has recently won several international competitions that are currently in development. Moye has been awarded with, uh, with the Young Creator Scholarship by the Mexican Art Council, Fonca Conaculta, for which he realized a, a series of interventions on public sidewalks that encourage new habits, or habits sorry, for pedestrians. She has collaborated for more than five years with Erzog and the Meuron and Sana um, in Switzerland, London, and Tokyo, designing and developing projects that she will explain. Um, now in further details, otherwise I will keep going. <laughs> so Leticia, uh, I'm, going, I'm going to read their bios also in the order of how they are going to speak later. So Leticia Lozano is member of Laboratorio para la Ciudad, the Civic Innovation and Urban Creativity Government Think Tank as head of Playful City, a research and experimentation area focused on understanding how play and playfulness can be active tools for city design and planning. The lab is a place to reflect about all things city and to explore other social scripts and urban futures for the largest megalopolis in the Western Hemisphere, working across diverse areas such as urban creativity, mobility, governance, civic tech. I mean, Spanish people, we talk very fast. We are the worst. <laughs> I will moderate. I will go slow. It's Jen, verdad? Okay. I see you like a ghost there. <laughs> okay, so um, she has a background in architecture from the UDL, UDL Lab Mexico and Politecnico di Torino, as well as an MA in Narrative Environments from Central St. Martin's College of Art and Design in UK. 
So Carla Fernandez is a Mexican fashion designer and cultural historian who is documenting, preserving, and bringing to contemporary relevance the rich textile heritage of Mexico's indigenous communities. Combining her passion for fashion and traditional Mexican garments and a deep respect for the artisans and communities who produce their own textile, she founded an ethical and sustainable business that includes a fashion label and a unique mobile design studio, Taller Flora. She has been visiting lecture at the MIT class, the, res the reverse engineering of warfare and opera for the ends of times. She was also a beneficiary of the Prince Klaus Award recipient in 2013, and she had also solo shows at the America Society in New York, Sideline Santa Fe, uh, at the Humex Museum, and also um, she did an exhibition called The Barefoot Designer, a passion, a passion for radical design at Isabella Stewart Garner Museum in Boston. So finally, uh, we have Alison Nieder. Alison is the executive editor of California Apparel News, a position she has held since 2000. She started writing for the publication in 1998 as a reporter covering manufacturing and textiles. Mrs. Nieder has worked in publishing and in the apparel industry in California and New York, including stints in the production and design department at Los Angeles Mrs. Manufacturer Carol Little, and New York-based children's wear company, Baby Talks. She has written for businesses, publications, Sportwear International, Fashion Reporter, and I Wear, Consumer, um, consumer Glosses, Nylon and Fashion, Canada, and online for Copenhagen-based, I don't know how to pronounce this, mytrnd.com, <laughs> a London-based, not just a label. So um, she has also a Master of Art degree in Journalism from New York University, a Bachelor of Science degree in Textiles and Clothing from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and studied fashion advertising and public relations at Parson, the new school. So um, I think it would be nice if we can start with a brief presentation of your work, and after we, we will engage into the dialogue. Sorry, I can see oh, you know, a little bit my back. <laughs> we are in front of, well, otherwise. Yeah, thank you. So I will start with a project that we completed recently this year, at the beginning of this year. And this is a residential house project. It's um, a refurbishment of an existing house from the 1930s in Mexico City, in the area of Polanco, and with an extension. And this is a 450,000, uh, sorry, 450 um, square meters. And no, can you go back, way back, please? Um, there, yeah, exactly. So here the challenges were how we keep the spirit of a 1930s house, but at the same time we bring a contemporary language bringing also new ideas like the greenery, how do people live with greenery in a house, but also how to introduce natural light and how to make the flow through the house a very um, kind of like organic um, um, thing. So if we could go next. Yeah, so, and also one thing we had very clear since the beginning was how to break the limits between the indoor and the outdoor of the house. How, even if you're in the middle of Mexico City, how can you enjoy of waking up in the middle of a garden? And this is a, something that we have actually achieved and we're very happy with. Um, we also work with local materials. So actually something that we really enjoy about working in Mexico, it's to not use any product from the catalog, but we ate basically every material that we need to use or that we want to specify, we just work with local materials, with local craftsmanship, and this is one of the beauties of, of working in Mexico. Yeah, and here, for example, we not just did the architecture, but we also designed the building furniture. But even, um, this is another thing that we appreciate about working in Mexico, that we are allowed to, to, to do everything we can. So, for example, here in this case, we designed even the lamps, even the light switches of the house. So, next one, yeah. Okay, so this is a totally different continent. This is a project that we um, completed a year ago in Bristol, in England. So this was a commission by the University of Bristol to 
create a permanent public artwork in the, in the Royal Fort Gardens. So this is part of the University of Bristol, but it's an open park. And here the commission was to show a collection of wood in a permanent way. This is a collection of more than 10,000 species of wood that are spanning more than 390 millions of years. So we have here some of the most um, old and, and most um, special pieces of wood. So one of the first actions here or the, that, we, that we thought was how do we, well, we wanted to create a landmark so people that are passing through the park, they would identify there's something happening there. So this is not just holding the collection, but it's also acting as something urban, something for people to use. There's even seats for people. And what we also wanted is not to give an obvious understanding of what this piece was. So people actually, we, we expect that people get, get triggered by this object there in the park, and they will walk around, find the slot, if you go to the next one, and then almost like in a Renaissance garden with the grottos, people will just look in and find, like in a cave, this treasure, this, this world of stalactites that contain the history of the wood in our world. So, and, and this is an architect, for an architect, this is a very special project to do because you are not designing a house for a family or a hospital. In this case, your brief is you have to make a space for people to look at something that has a very strong meaning. So it's actually a space for meditation, it's a space for observation. And this for us was really special and really challenging. For this project, we didn't work alone. We worked together with an artist, Katie Patterson. She's a um, Berlin-based artist but actually from Scotland, and um, together we did the whole process from the conception of the idea to the completion of the project. And very important, if you go to the next one, is we didn't want to use any artificial light, so this is all natural light, creating this kind of like dapple light, almost like as when you walk through a forest. This is the, 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 the atmosphere we wanted to create. Next one, okay. So this is a competition that we just won recently. So I'm showing you just like very recent work. Uh, so this is a competition we won a few days ago for Guadalajara in Mexico. This is an area of Guadalajara that is called Zapopan. And basically here is where one of the largest codec plants um, in, in the world existed in, in, in this area. So this client bought the Kodak plant and decided he's going to develop that into a part of the city. So he um, did a master plan um, together with SOM, American-based firm, to develop all these areas um, like housing, hospitals, uh, offices, etc. And the client decided that the Central Park was going to be an open, uh, a competition by invitation, and we won this competition. So we are uh, now starting the, the, the process of developing this park and it's not just the park, it has a lot of functions. It has a plaza, it has an underground auditorium, it has a building with a market, art school, and some other facilities like cafes, etc. So for this project, we decided not to enter alone, but we are rather to collaborate on one side with landscape architects, Mexican landscape architects, on the other side with um, the England uh, firm Arup, Obe Arup, they are engineers, to my eyes, one of the best engineering firms in the world. And we have entered with them because for us, it was not just about putting plants there and solving an architectural brief, but it was about the opportunity we had to create a park in Mexico to make this a living element that performs. So basically what we explain to the client is this park does, that doesn't need any energy from, from you we're gonna produce all our energy and all the waste we're gonna use again to produce, um, um, to, to have a, sust a sustainable system. So, and the architecture itself, it's also performing, not as a passive element, but as active element. So everything that you see there in the park has a function. For example, the lake is, is, is performing. I'm not gonna go so much into detail, but if you go to the next one, so it's also very much about the relationship of architecture and park. So a lot of 
um, 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 I mean, an approach could have been to just have a park and then the building with a facade, but we thought this building should not have a facade because in Mexico we have the opportunity to enjoy the weather, so then we avoid having these spaces air conditioned and, you know, which is not a good idea in Mexico. So we have cross ventilations and we have this very near contact with the nature. If you go to the next one, and yeah, and then the building becomes almost like a natural space in itself where we have cross views, cross ventilations, not just in an horizontal way, but also in a vertical way. And it's also very important for us to enhance the views from the users of the park into the users of the building. Next one. And we are also designing an underground auditorium where we didn't think of it just as this space, which is also a beautiful space, but it's, it's, it's an enclosed box. But we thought, what about giving it the chance to also have a contact to the outside? So we created this kind of eye at the top, so people who are passing in the plaza, crossing the plaza, they can also overlook what's happening in the, in the auditorium, and even people in the intermediate level, that is the lobby area. Next one. Okay, a very different scale of project. Um, this is a, a project we're developing together with Infonavit. This is the social housing institution in Mexico. And with them, we're developing different projects. And this one we, we enjoy very much because it's, it's about developing a prototype of a rural housing. So this is for one, um, it's very little money for, to build these houses. And what we proposed to the Infonavit was, we're not gonna give you just one house. We're gonna give you a system. So this house is not a rigid form, but actually, wherever you want to put it, it will change its form according to the money these people have, to the requirements of these families, etc. So if you go to the next one. So what was very nice for us was in the moment we went to this town, Coquimatlan, in Colima, uh, we understood that people actually don't spend almost any time inside their houses, that almost everything they do is outside. Basically, they cook with fire outside, they eat outside, they even sleep in hamacas outside. And because of the weather, the hot weather, they actually enjoy more being below the trees and outside. So we thought, okay, we're gonna make a house that doesn't impose a new system of living, a contemporary way of living, but we keep their traditions and the way they live, but of course providing them with a better, stronger structure that they need. If you go to the next one, and um, yeah, this is just a, a visualization of it. We can go to the next one. By the way, this um, Coquimatlan housing, we're just gonna start the construction. Uh, we're final finalizing all the um, construction documents. That's where we are. And this is a totally different continent again. <laughs> uh, now we go to a competition we won this year in Berlin. This was an open competition where artists could enter together with architects. It's a memorial for Luther, Martin Luther, in the commemoration of the 500 years of the um, Reformation of the Lutheran Church. And we won this competition amongst other 100 entries. And um, basically our idea, well, I should mention the, the, the place is in Berlin, in Mitte, for those who know Berlin. It's just behind Alexanderplatz, near the Marienkirche, that is um, this church that you see here. And basically the idea was a memorial to not be the typical monument where there's an object or a state uh, um, that you are looking up. So here the idea was, let's make the opposite and the inverse imprint of this monument, but to go downwards. So with this action, we bring the existing um, figure of Luther, which is one of those figures that you see over there, and we bring it down into the eye level of the user. So with this action, we are, we are also following the ideas that Luther or the Reformation um, brought to Berlin, uh, sorry, to, to, yeah, to Germany or to, to, the, to, to the Reformation of the church that was to open up um, the language, to open up the Bible, etc. But nowadays, we're just bringing this more close to people. If you go to the next one, yeah. Okay, so if you see, this is actually the, the imprint of an existing memorial that was destroyed on the Second World War that used to live in this place. So we actually used the geometry of this memorial and did an opposite imprint into the ground, cr creating at the same time these spaces for people to sit and gather. And we used one of the existing looters 
but we have a new one. So these two are looking at each other and the third person becomes a visitor and we try to create not a monologue, but a dialogue. Next one. Yeah, and we also integrate LED um, lights into the concrete. This is Bricka's concrete flooring. And this is, of course, not something that will be very glowing very strong. It's something quite modest, but this is for um, to give messages or quotes about Luther. Um, so we're referring again to the language, which is something very related to the Reformation. Next one. Um, okay, um, this is a, an, again a memorial. We, this is the second memorial we, we've done. But this is a memorial for the Anfal genocide in Kurdistan. Kurdistan is an, the independent region in Iraq. This is a project we're doing together with the German government, with an um, NGO called Hao Kari. And um, this is a very special project for us because it's a region called Rizkari, that it's a town called Rizkari, where people came just from, from this genocide to establish themselves there and they don't have anything like a place to gather or a place to commemorate this event that is still in their, very present in their everyday life. So what we did was a void. So this circle in the center represents a void to symbolize the loss or what happened, but life took over and now it's a green space. And if you go to the next one, it's all starting from an existing artwork of 1,500 photographs of people who lost somebody holding a picture or an object from this person they lost. And this is why we gave the shape of a circle. So we don't want to have any hierarchy. So we give a, a circle so there's, no, there's more people who lost, peop uh, who lost somebody else. So, and so with this, we want to create an open gallery, an open space for people to mourn or to visit these people. And the architecture in, or, or the other functions are just around this. If you go to the next one, uh, basically the functions like auditoriums, uh, libraries, etc., are all around this, this circle. Next one. And just finally, this is the last project. Um, this is uh, something we're developing with the gallery Arena Mexico in Guadalajara, from Guadalajara, Mexico. And uh, we are, together with them, we're working on a project that is called Ideal Standard, where they are working on creating um, utilitarian objects with a design or artistic value. So we worked, we decided to work with this block, it's a construction block, where you apply an artisanal process, a craftsmanship process um, of this mirroring cladding. And we're on the process of developing this as a product together with them. And in the meantime, last year, if you go to the next one, um, uh, the gallery invited us to do an, in an installation for Design Week Mexico in the Museum Tamayo in the patio. And we decided to do use as a motif the volcanoes. Um, so the volcano as a representation, as an artistic representation that was very fashionable on other times like Dr. Atl or Jose Maria Velasco. And nowadays it's not that natural landscape that is represented. Nowadays we did, we did a representation of this landscape, this motif of the volcanoes that na nowadays in Mexico it became this um, kind of eaten by the urban sprawl. Uh, it's an artificial landscape. So when you look around in Mexico City, it's not this beautiful natural valley anymore, but it's an artificial built landscape. And this is um, an, um, then a, a model of, actually it's an exact model of the Popocatépetl volcano in Mexico. It even has a crater on top. <laughs> and if you go to the next one, yeah, we enjoyed also very much. Kids loved it and <laughs> everyone was climbing and looking up into the crater it was a lot of fun, yeah. I don't know if they have the presentation. Uh, well, my name is Leticia again, and I'm, I come from uh, Lab, CD, Lab CDMX, which is the um, innovate, civic innovation and urban creativity area of Mexico City's government. The presentation. The presentation. Um, okay. Uh, 
Yeah, so the lab... Uh, here it is. Yeah, uh, that's not the first slide. No. Um, okay, so the lab started on um, 2000, well, it started like almost four years ago. Um, it, it started with the current mayor of Mexico City. And one thing that we're not, uh, I don't know why I started speaking in English, is that okay? Or should I change so no, to Spanish? No, 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 do it in English, <laughs> you don't have to do it in, I mean, do it in the language. Uh, yeah, so it starts with the current mayor and then um, we're uncertain about our future. Sadly, so it will depend on how the projects, how well we innovate the projects and the impact it has on, on people. Um, okay, so if we go next one, please. That's Mexico City. It looks a bit like LA when I saw it this morning from the plane. <laughs> next one. <laughs> Don't know. <laughs> okay, so um, I will be talking about only the 16 boroughs of Mexico City because the lab is within the local government, so we can only have impact within those 16 boroughs. Um, well, for those who, who don't know, then the whole metropolitan area is with 16 municipalities plus the 16 boroughs. So that's the 21 million people. Um, okay, so next one, please. So what is, uh, how, how can a creative office within Mexico City's government work for its citizens. Next. Um, as I said, the lab for the city is, the, is divided in these two areas, civic innovation and urban creativity. Next. And the team is a little bit 50-50 between creative people and social sciences people. So we have politicians, um, well, yes, politicians, geographers, urbanists, architects, filmmakers, photographers, um, art directors, um, and international relationship people, and um, pol political sciences. And we divide, next one, next. and we divide ourselves into these five areas of research and experimentation. Uh, they're called cities, so we call them cities, so we, we're talking about the future we want to see in Mexico City. Uh, so they're called Creative City, Proposal City, Playful City, Open City, and Pedestrian City. Next one, please. So what we do with the lab is we have this kind of gatherings where the role of the people from the lab is to kind of be that person in between. So between academy, government, and uh, civic, uh, civic society. Civic society. And just try to put them in the same place with a problem and try to work for a solution that has an impact on the, on the, on the whole city. Not just politicians, not just academia. Um, next one, please. So we have done things like this. So this is, a, this is just an infographics of a project called Mapathon, which was the first marathon of mapping, it was a crowdsourced effort. So it lasted for three weeks. We developed an app, and it helped us um, to solve a problem. So in Mexico City, we didn't have before this, we didn't have a map where we could visualize all the uh, public transport, especially buses, all the routes. So you didn't know where they would go. So you, it was just like you have to go to a corner and say, hey, where are you going? Okay, so this is really, really difficult if you're thinking of a city that has nine million people to transport and, you know, you have to do efficient mobility for them. Um, so we did this and we had a lot of people participating. We had prices and it was, it was loads of fun, really. So you only had to go inside a bus, turn your app and then go from start to end. And then we started to see that we have routes that go up to 10 hours from Mexico City, illegal, but you know, we still need to know them. Next one. Uh, we also have, that's the mayor of Mexico City. Um, we also ha have done the uh, open government uh, law, which means 
uh, many areas of Mexico City's government have to open the data. This is a law that it does not mean that they do it. So now our work is to kind of push different areas for them to open the data. And the opening of the data, next one, comes with a lot of hackathons. So we do marathons of hacking with the government data and uh, hackers, civic hackers we call them, they come, they stay there, they have a sleepover, or well, they don't really sleep, but they stay in the same place and they just develop apps <laughs> to solve a problem for, for the city. Sorry, next one. And we also do these kind of things. Uh, so this is a, um, an ability improvement course for creatives. Uh, so what happens is that in Mexico City, creatives were asking for like, hey, I don't know how to do an invoice. Hey, I don't know how to do a, we call it the elevator pitch, you know, like five minutes or just two minutes um, to sell a project. Or I don't know how to transform what I do into a business. So what we did, we just gather a lot of creatives that have a lot of expertise and then we just put them in a series of workshops and then we did a call out and a lot of creatives that are starting their careers, they came. Uh, next one. We also work with um, uh, presupuesto participativo. Participatory, Participatory budget, budget <laughs> uh, programs. Uh, because they're not really well known in Mexico. Well, there's two, but one is very well known. The other one is not. So we're building this platform for people to see the projects, talk about them, and if a student from architecture wants to go with his neighbor and say, hey, I can do the render, when that would be a very good outcome from that. <laughs> Next one. Um, and now I'm just gonna go into the, the Playful City um, area, which is the one that I coordinate. And um, we, next one. <coughs> we work in these three axes. So play, learning, and public space. Next one. Um, so we start from the knowledge that we all have about play, how play improves creativity, resilience, curiosity, and exploration, and, and it helps children to uh, yeah, explore their personal boundaries and also their internal boundaries. So through play, they start to build their social relations, they start to build confidence in themselves, they, ha they start to build trust with each other. Next one. Um, but then what happens, in Mexico City, we have over two million children that are not being looked after. So on urban development terms, children are only looked as vulnerable population. So they're just kind of put in the backyard, not care for them. Next one. Um, so what, uh, Playful City comes here as this experimentation area, like uh, Ruth was saying, where we uh, kind of research the role of play as a tool for urban development and as a channel to bring children's children perspective into urban design and planning. Next one. Um, and what are the challenges of uh, play in Mexico City? So the first one is that we adults, we don't believe in play. We don't believe it is a good thing. We only think it's a waste of time. Um, the, Next one is abuse of technology. <laughs> well, some of them. <laughs> abuse of technology, so children are spending a lot of time with the technology. So there's an atmosphere of violence. Um, for example, uh, the second cause of children dying in Mexico City are um, car accidents. 90% of those car accidents can be prevented. So we are planning our cities in the wrong way um, if we are creating this very hazardous environment for our children. Uh, the next one is the lack of, of acknowledgement uh, of play in public policy. Um, the other one is, the, uh, so this one comes from the IPA, which is the International Play Association. They did a study in 2010 in Mexico City um, about the, the situation of play, and they found out that children in Mexico City are uh, kind of, they have um, 
they are overloaded with activities. This, don't, this does not mean that they go to piano lessons, like everyone goes to piano lessons. It only means that if they have to take care of their little brother or if they have to like accompany their parents in the afternoon with at their jobs, then they don't have really uh, free time for free play. The next one is um, the problem with the, with the equity in green spaces and open spaces. Um, so then we end up with this kind of thing. So, sorry, yeah, next. <laughs> we end up with this kind of spaces. So Mexico City is a city that has developed in an urban way, giving the priority to the car as many other cities. Next one. Um, so then we have spaces like this. Iztapalapa is one of the boroughs. Well, it's the borough that has more than half a million children living there, and it only has 0.6 square meters of green space. And then, in contrast, then we have Miguel Hidalgo, which is a very nice borough of Mexico City, and it has 12.5 square meters per person, and it only has less than 100,000 children. Next. Uh, and then this, this comes from just normal, regular adults. Uh, that they put up signs and say, you can't play here, it's forbidden, you can't engage in a soccer match, <laughs> which actually happens a lot in Mexico, but okay. Next one. Uh, so it's really not surprising that we end up with spaces like this one, next one, or that one. <laughs> next one. So we started to ask ourselves what's going on. Next one. Um, so we mapped out where are children living in Mexico and where are the green open spaces in contrast. So if you see the bigger the circle in the, um, in the block, the uh, more children that are living there. And the green open spaces are the, the ones in green. So next one, the, we see things like this. So the ones in pink, are uh, blocks that have more than 200 children living there. So then, and then the green open spaces in green. So then we have uh, where, where there are more children, we don't have green spaces, and when there's more green spaces, we don't have children. Next. Um, then we mapped out uh, who has to be in the room for a play space to happen. Okay, in Spanish, we don't even have a, a word for playground, so we start from there. So who has to be in the same room to a play space or a playground to happen? All of those people. And that means that they're not gonna come, they're not gonna get together, they're not gonna actually agree on something. Next one. Uh, so then we started to evaluate the play spaces with children. So we develop a tool, it's downloadable, you can do it in your local park, um, just to understand what children were thinking of the spaces we were leaving them. Next one. Um, next one. And then we released this publication, which is all of this kind of analysis that I'm talking about, and also a series of public policy recommendations on why we should um, try to think more of, of children, of play, and from an urban perspective. Next, next one. And then. Then we do immediate answer projects. Next one. So we do pop-up play spaces in the subway. Next one. We do play streets in different areas of Mexico City. We even bring our Mexican superheroes to play with children. Next one. <laughs> Next one. We. This one we're developing with MIT, so we're trying to do different learning urban environments, so by hacking already existing uh, urban spaces. So this, the whole idea is that you can um, kind of code the sequence of the lights in the fountain. Next one. And now we're going into a strategy of how can we take back spaces that are supposed to be for children that are already there, but for some reason they're underused. So this one has uh, 
bar wire, I think it's called, the thing on the top. And then it's locked all week. And it's only open on Saturday mornings. Um, and this was the government's uh, response to, I don't know the political word, but homeless people going inside. So they just close it off for everyone. Next one. So we're trying to bring this kind of things into the spaces. So what happens if we do urban, um, temporary urban interventions that instigate play in these spaces? And we, we try to change the interactions that this, the, the spaces and the physicality of the spaces are actually making. Next one. So what's next? We'll see. <laughs> So I would like to finish with this uh, quote from Lady Ellen of Herwood, which is better a broken bone than a broken spirit. Thank you. Hello, buenas tardes. I, want, I, I prepared this um, talk in Spanish, but I'll do my best. And um, next one, please. I am a fashion designer. And when I started to get interested in fashion, I um, made everything that a fashion designer shouldn't be doing. That was my teachers were saying. I, my father, he used to be the director of the, museum, the, the museums of the Instituto Nacional de Antropología e Historia. Um, I know we have great translators in both ways. <laughs> so I used to go with him where the pyramids are. And I, used, I was nine years old. And I saw these beautiful girls and, and, and women dressed as I ever seen before. I, am, I was born at the north in Mexico City, and uh, um, we used to go to shopping sprees to, to, the, to, to the States, so I pretty knew how much was going happening in, in terms of fashion. My mother was the first one that used hot pants in Saltillo. <laughs> <laughs> so imagine if I wouldn't know that. Um, but even if I knew so much about Western fashion, I was so obsessed with the way that indigenous communities dressed. So I used to tell my mother and my sister, okay, let's go for that chuch, no? that it's a kind of a jacket. And we went to the market and we couldn't find it because they would not sell it to uh, tourists because tourists won't understand um, the complexity and, and the time and won't pay for it. And I just didn't understand why in Mexico we're not working with the best designers that there's like plenty of them, but they live in the deserts, in the highlands, and uh, in las montañas, in los desiertos, y en, en la selva. So this is I, what I decided to do our third book. Um, I just made this photo shooting with Graciela Iturbide. She's a very good friend of mine and an amazing photographer. And Graciela, she always lives in this Alice in Wonderland, and now this is Alice in Xochimilco. Oh. <laughs> and this, this girl that has like these two peyotes, no, that she's looking through, and that's how I feel. Next, please. In Mexico, 95% of uh, the textile artisan are women. And um, it's very interesting because um, it's completely different of what happens in India or what happens in, in, in Asia because we, the, the, the crops are getting extinguished. I know that is happening all around the world, but I am pretty concerned about Mexico. There are like 52 uh, live languages in my country, and I think that that helps us a lot to be a cultural power because you see that in everything. So you see it even in, in the, in the um, um, art that you see in the museums, how it permeates all this uh, creativity. But what is happening is that no one is paying what it needs to be paid so the women can stay in their communities. And we have talked in this panel already how, um, and previously, 
they, we, they have to go and look for opportunities. Next one, please. So what happens when the mother leaves the community? The 10-year-old kid takes care of the 7-year-old kid, the 6, the 4, and the 3. And I've seen terrible tragedies. As I've been to the buried of the 7 kid of 8. So that there was only one alive, and that is one of a lot of stories that I can tell you. So we need to stop that. So how uh, no one is working in, in, the, in El Campo, in the, how you say Campo? Fields. Countryside. In the, in the countryside. Fields. No, so when the, the fields. So, so when we go to the, to the fields, to the Campo, so it's us and the ones that siembran marijuana <laughs> and the Japanese, no? and the Japanese that is also looking for the same natural dye. Um, and obviously this becomes like a larger tragedy and a, a, a natural uh, disequilibrium. So, and next one please. We're, it's like, I mean, we're very small, but more and more people like, like working together so, pe oh, so the artisans can stay where they know, where they are happy with their families. Next one, please. Next. We believe um, that um, originality comes from the origin. As I said, I am very lucky to know Mexico pretty well. This is Pascuala that I work with, and she is amazing. And we work with women that have been developing their craft for thousands of years, you know? So it's amazing, next one, how they go to the mountain, they pick eight uh, sticks, or the husband brings them to them, they grow their own cotton or take care of the lamb, and they do these amazing garments. Just, they don't need anything else, you know? Next one, please. For example, this is a, a, a good example of how we work. Okay, but I can speak Spanish, but am I doing okay? Yeah. Yes? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, this is Don Juan Alonso. Um, I don't know if you have one of these molinillos to rub the chocolate. What happened to this community, there's like 1,200 molinillo makers in this region. No one else, no one is buying these objects anymore because uh, Starbucks, you can go and you get it like all in polvo, mm -hmm. pulverizado, yeah. Yeah. or um, you just have one already. And um, so I went with a Juan, I asked Marta Turok, he's like, who's the best molinillero in, no, in the town? And he said, like, Don Juan. And the father of Don Juan used to do uh, wood carving, and he used to put in the, in the big, in the, in el dedo gordo del pie, mm -hmm. in the big foot, one of the finger, a toe, yes, a string, so and he way. used to pull out, and that's how the torno would like start, and he would like harp, so amazing. And he's like the next generation. What is amazing is that um, now no one needs an, anymore. So I went to Don Juan and said, it's like, what happens if these rings, we just blew them up and make bracelets? And those bracelets, now we sell them in Japan, in the States, <laughs> in Europe, in Mexico. Uh, and then it became a trend. So another designers started to make tables with now do shoes, bags, etc. And what I believe is that we have to, is what I call zapatero to zapatos. It's very difficult to do a fashion brand or whatever it needs alone. And that is what in Mexico do. Even if you're a designer, they ask you to be a very good designer, a super entrepreneur, doing super commercial. And obviously, you're not going to be no, good in some of those phases, and it's going to be a tragedy. And that's what we always ask the um, craftsmen to do. And it's impossible because we don't have that time, in, less in the communities, because the women have eight kids and they have to go and bring the food and et cetera, so it's very complicated. At the end of the day, next one, please. You have to solve problems. Next one, please. Well, we believe that fashion is not ephemeral and tradition is not static. Next one. This is an example of our garments 
right here is Teotitlán del Valle. Um, this is Beto, that for sure you know, uh, Eduardo. This is Food Loom and Natural Dyes, and it has a um, phrase of a poem of Nexahualcoyot. And this one is very interesting over here. Next one, please. These are the spirits of San Pablito Pahuatlán. Once again, the communities call us to go and collaborate. It's, not, it's like only 10% of the groups that we work with, we just go and tell them, I want to work with you. Mainly they call us and we work with them. So the Pahuatlán in Puebla, these spirits are pre-Hispanic and they offer them to the mountain to get cosecha. So like, ¿cómo se dice? Cosecha, I don't know. Harvest. Harvest. <laughs> So um, they have to be white because the black ones, they produce like black magic. And instead of making them um, in papel amate, we do them in, uh, in, in fabric. Next one. This is a project. It's not a project. It's something that I wanted to do. Um, I was very angry <laughs> when um, Trump uh, won the elections. So I, like 20 days before he was taking power, I post on Facebook, it's like, let's go and do something, no? I was on Facebook and 15 friends replied, like, yes, let's go, <laughs> because I am Mexican, I am a woman, and uh, I couldn't believe it. Mm. So I always been very interested on how um, there's like clothing in the communities it's made to harvest and to, uh, to, to let you move. And um, I've been to, to Mexico to, to ¿cómo se dicen marchas? Protest. To protest. Yes. So, um, so I was like, okay, let's go. And we have to say what we want to not to translate. So this is kind of, of a wall, <laughs> no? And it says, we're all Mexican today. Next one, please. And everyone was like saying what they wanted. It, it's painted by hand by a friend of mine, que es un rotulista. So this is mine, not for grabbing, and etc. Next one. And this is actually a fact. If you go to San Miguel de Allende, to Merida, to Tulum, no? to La Condesa, or La Roma, you will see that a lot of Americans are coming to live in Mexico City. And we're very happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> Next one. Uh, just one before. But what was very funny is that I was prepared. These garments are made that you can run. Because I thought that we were have to run. So all of us, <laughs> you could like take them very fast or grab them around and run. And then you could have like, like something to put like your water because it was not meant that you could not have water. So, it was, so imagine the Mexican women designing this to run and to protect yourself and your friends. And obviously, it was a very quiet. Uh, <laughs> Next one, please. Next. This is uh, Museo Jumex. We did an exhibition a year ago um, that Julieta invited us to do. And I truly believe that we have to share knowledge and we have to get to talk and to see what has worked for you and what hasn't because that makes us life, you know, safer and you make it better in, in a way. So this is Cecilia. Uh, Cecilia has been doing these workshops here and Maria, is this Maria? And um, imagine that Ceci created this workshop where you can weave in a week. And she created it. And it's amazing. So this is actually outside of the Humex uh, exhibition space. Next. Also, we tend to do things the way we believe is the best for us as a company and uh, as what we want to, to transmit. Uh, I don't understand like the catwalks because they're too fast and we work very hard, all of us, to make that garment. We spend lots of time making a new technique or going to the communities or them coming back. So um, we work 
sometimes with different, like dance, that someone was asking for dance. We use uh, dance to show our garments because I love the way they are in movement. And also these are like unisex or women or men, but they're used by men and women on stage. These are Silas and Rashaun. They used to dance for Merce Cunningham and we do amazing, crazy dances. Next. Oh, well, just one before. And that is a sculpture of Pedro Reyes, that is my husband. And that one uh, <laughs> that I love. And <laughs> so he, he gave me that sculpture. And uh, for example, down here is this is um, the, the collection that is now happening is called Dance, the Danzas y Ceremonias, Rituals, Dances and Ceremonies, ceremonies yeah. Dances and Ceremonies. So as we saw, we had like the spirits of Pahuatlán. These are the tequan, like the spots of the jaguar that actually they're meant in the dances of Guerrero to give you strength and to protect you of the evil eye. And then we have the chaquira that it also has like the reflection. So it goes on and on. And we have the, the jingles of the powo dance. Next one. Next one, please. This is the exhibitions that we do because for us it's very important that our customer understands the processes of what we're doing. And obviously of the technique, because otherwise you will not pay for it and will not understand it. Next one. Uh, next one. We believe that the future is handmade. I know that for many, uh, it's the, the future is technology, but I think that also the future is handmade. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of background about California Apparel News and a really quick overview of the apparel industry in LA and our relationship to Mexico. Um, California Apparel News is a weekly fashion trade publication. We've been covering the business of fashion since 1945. Everything that we do sort of goes through a California filter. Um, oh, sure. Um, I will try my best. <laughs> um, Seventy years ago, the apparel industry in the U.S. Was, was very regional, and over the decades, it's become national and international. Um, but today, Los Angeles is still the largest garment center in the U.S. We produce for the local market, we produce for national and international labels. Um, we're known for certain categories, specifically denim. Uh, we do well with t-shirts. Um, and we, we do also have sort of a high-end fashion discipline as well. Um, our relationship with Mexico, it has always been a resource for the apparel industry. Um, going back to the 1980s and specifically in the early 90s. In the early 90s, a lot of manufacturers began sending their production overseas, well, to Mexico. And um, that was the beginning of NAFTA, essentially. Um, in 2000, we uh, eliminated the quotas on goods from China, and a lot of that manufacturing moved overseas. Fast forward to now, production is, is very fluid, and you can move it around the world fairly easily. In the past, you had to, to hire somebody and send someone overseas and, and have them develop the market. Now, it's, you know, it is all done online. It's done through consultants. Um, but what we're seeing right now is a lot of the production is coming back to Los Angeles and also to Mexico. Los Angeles can only handle a certain volume. And so Mexico is a fantastic alternative because it's close. You can get something in two weeks if it's produced close to the border or in <coughs> three weeks if it's produced in Mexico City. Um, so there's just there's been a very good relationship between the two countries. Um, but as I said, it can move very quickly. So what's happening right now as the US administration is looking again at NAFTA, um, apparel companies are nervous and they're starting to look at other areas and what they want is they want the same quality and and um, 
ease that they have in Mexico. They want to be able to get something quickly. They want to be able to um, have enjoy a certain expertise. Um, and for a lot of them, they're going further south. And so they're looking at Central America. They're looking at the Caribbean. Um, and that's sort of where where we stand today. Now, as, as I said, my, my background is really the business side of fashion. I deal um, primarily with larger companies, but we do also have a, a small artisan sort of tradition um, here in Los Angeles. So I, you know, I can sort of wear both hats. Okay, thank you, Alice. Um, well, I'm going to start the dialogue between us, but I think if, I mean, the people from the public, if you want to ask questions at the same time that we are talking, I think it's fine. So we don't have to talk between us and after to open the questions to the public. If somebody wants to intervene, it's very welcome. So as I said at the beginning, and this is more a question for Carla and for Alison, and thinking about the fashion market, um, I'm very interested in how, for instance, um, um, Carla always has this kind of practice with a kind of collaborative work, and how you incorporate all the time the knowledge of other, um, of the communities where you work, no? So it's not about also doing, but also how you can incorporate this knowledge in a way, no? Uh, and also, in addition, and very important, is this idea of a fair and equitable trade and labor relationship, and it's totally implicit in your work. I know your work is also very slow in a way, you know? Um, but as Alison was saying, on the other hand, Mexico has been for decades like a robust apparel A robust, yeah, like that, better? Yes, yeah, sounds like like a kind of robust apparel manufacturing base, uh, but not always in fair conditions and f um, for both countries, no? So I would like if you can explain from your point of view, Carla, how this is something that impact in your work when you try to work, I mean, in the United States or outside Mexico, no? And also, Alison, if you can also provide us with some samples of a kind of... Um, more equitable and sustainable relationships that have, has been built between both countries through certain kind of companies, like sample, like positive example that you can explain us that how you can create these kind of relationships of working, but in a more equitable and fair um, way. Would you like to start? <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. um, well, you know, a prime example would be the <laughs> denim industry. Um, the, we have a we have a very um, active denim industry in Los Angeles, and there is also a very active denim community in, in Mexico. And there is a lot of travel back and forth. Denim to a lot of people seems like a util utilitarian garment, but it actually requires an awful lot of handwork and a lot of expertise in order to get a pair of jeans to look the same when you buy this pair of jeans and then the next pair of jeans. There's, there's really a craft to it. Um, and a lot of the denim manufacturers will move their production, U.S. denim manufacturers, will move their production back and forth between the U.S. and Mexico. Um, obviously for price reasons, um, they will move to, to take advantage of lower labor prices. Um, but they're not going to just move unless they can see that there's that expertise there. So it, it has been a very close relationship. Mm -hmm. Well, and um, in terms of the industry in Mexico, it's something happened when they opened China, because before, like, the industry didn't have to develop creativity in Mexico, because they were, like, designing for Dona Cara, and they were designing for Calvin Klein, etc. cetera, and uh, when China comes and the, it's opened the market with China, suddenly all these in the industries in Mexico, they don't have nowhere to go, and they start looking to Mexican designers. So you see, it's like, for example, now, I will give you an example of uh, denim, for, no, that we're talking about. They, the, the textile industry is happy that the NAFTA, maybe something would happen, you mm -hmm. know, <laughs> because sometimes the trade was not that um, favorable, not that uh, favorable for both sides. So you never know who is being um, a beneficiado, mm -hmm. the benefits of these treats and, and, and the other ones. Obviously, I work with communities uh, in many of these states that, in the other hand, uh, there's only women or very few um, men. 
and they have come here to the States to work uh, in, in looking for better opportunities. So we have to work and again, no, give these opportunities in Mexico, in our land as well. Um, if I can just jump in. One thing that I found that is interesting with our trade agreements around the world is when there was a giant rush to go to Mexico and, and labor prices were mm -hmm. very low, it was not just the apparel industry, it was a lot of industries went to Mexico. Um, and over time, the workers wanted to get better paying jobs, better paying than apparel, and then they would go to work in automotive or electronics. Mm -hmm. And you see the same thing in China. Today, China labor prices are rising because of the exact same thing. Once you send all of that business to an area, you, you start to create competition and the, the wages rise. They're not quite, they're not even close to US standards, but what end up, ends up happening with the industry is then they start looking elsewhere. So for example, <laughs> right now, they're looking at Vietnam. Eventually, labor prices will rise. They'll, they'll, they just will keep looking to sort of maximize the dollar. So there, that is one thing that was a byproduct. And it was something that a lot of people who looked at NAFTA knew that that was going to happen. It was, it was part of the, the appeal of bringing all of that mm -hmm. business and jobs. And that is also something that we have to work against. No, that is part of the manifesto that I was that talking to you later before. It's, it's crazy how in the fashion industry, the amount of winning, o sea, the ganancia you have to have, it's crazy. So that's why mm -hmm. no, the workers cannot be doing that. It's, it's completely out of control. So we also have to be very aware and saying it's like, well, this is the cost of this and stop buying a million things in whatever fast fashion is. So it's very tricky. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if somebody wants to ask something, because we don't have a lot of time, otherwise I will keep it. Uh, oh, okay. No, that it's when, when you have a producer, uh, el obrero, the, work, the worker, it's always they ask uh, that company that is producing to be very cheap prices in order that the mm -hmm. apparel industry wins a lot of money. And it, so it's like 300% or 500% like the, the earnings. So in fashion, it's crazy how much money you can earn if you're a fashion house or if you have a brand or, or you have like a fashion, a fast fashion because you sell millions of jeans. You know, I, I, I know a, f a factory in Mexico that they produce one million jeans per month. Imagine how many are fabrics around the world are like that. So jeans, I don't know how many jeans are produced per year. Right. Also, hundreds of millions of jeans. Mm -hmm. And that is trash at the end of the day. And that is also people that, uh, workers that are being underpaid. So we also have to be very careful on, on how fashion is made. Well, I have another question that uh, um, for me is interesting regarding what you explained it about uh, Laboratorio para la Ciudad. Leticia, I know this is a, a like go governmental idea and you have been implemented that in Mexico City, um, but you have also been trying this idea in other Latin American cities. And I also would like to ask you if these, are, these ideas has been, I mean, if you have also tried or like tested here, like in the United States, if you have been uh, working with institutions or universities here, and if you think this kind of project that you're developing there at Laboratorio para la Ciudad, they're kind of idea that works in developing countries or is something that can be extended also uh, to, to a place like, you know, I mean, like for instance, like in Los Angeles. Um, yeah, we haven't tried any of our projects in an American city, mm -hmm. but we have worked uh, very closely, especially with universities, so MIT, UCL, Yale, and we have uh, interns as mm -hmm. well uh, working with, with us, because we do also believe in sharing knowledge. Um, in regards of like the replication of, of the projects, I think, it depends on the project. So some projects, like the one I was telling you about of the uh, bus routes, 
So that has been uh, replicated in uh, the Middle East, I'm going to say, because I can't remember the name of the city. Um, in South America and in a couple of um, cities in Mexico. Um, <clears throat> it, it, um, the, those, those replicas uh, were different in scales, mm -hmm. so that's good. Um, all the projects that we develop, they have to be thought uh, as something, something that can be uh, done again mm -hmm. under similar conditions that can be scaled up or down. Um, so yeah, it, it will depend on the project. So it's not going to be just for Latin American mm -hmm. cities, but it can be for megalopolises, or if it has that um, idea of scaling it mm -hmm. down, so it can be also for medium or even small cities. I mean, it only com it comes from the problem. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's just a solution that. Um, yeah, that can be I was thinking when you were talking about the Laboratorio para la Ciudad, I came to my mind, like, uh, and you know also, Carla, about him, when Antanas Mokus, the, the, the mayor of Bogota, was doing this kind of experiment in a way of uh, working as a kind of gabinete, I don't know, like, like close gabinete. Uh, like there were people from the humanities, no, like philosophers, but also designers or architects, um, to develop ideas and projects. To I mean, in their in the in this case was just to help to down to slow down or to down the crime in Bogota, and it was very effective in a way. So. Um, yeah, I think even if you say that it will depend on the government that is at that moment, what is going to be the future, but it's definitely something that has been tested in different ways and has been always working really well. Yeah, no, I think Antanas Mokus is one of our... Uh, one heroes. Of our heroes, <laughs> yes, but also of, like, if you talk within um, people working mm -hmm. in think tanks and labs around the world, they're always referring to him as... Uh, pioneer on doing social experiments mm -hmm. from the government and just mm -hmm. trying to change behavior. Mm -hmm. I know, yeah, please. Yeah. I just read that uh, following what happened with the coal industry, retail is where the next tsunami of unemployment is going to happen. Mm -hmm. J. Crew, bankrupt. Lunar Marcus, bankrupt. Sears Roebuck, long ago. How is that going to impact the fashion world? Oof. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's, it's, we're going, undergoing a major shift. Um, people are buying differently than they used to, um, which, you know, to your point, uh, could be good for people who buy a little bit more thoughtfully, who don't buy disposable fashion. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, it's, it's undergoing a process. People do not want to shop the way they used to want to shop. Um, here in Los Angeles, for many years, we had a, a fantastic independent boutique um, tradition. We had stores that people from around the world would come to shop. During the recession, we lost a lot of those stores, and it's slowly coming back, but um, you know, as everyone knows, real estate in Los Angeles is expensive. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's a challenge. So from our point of view, we're looking at those independent retailers to sort of take up the slack that's lost from these ma like major department stores. Could you give an example of those independent retailers? The ones that have come back or the ones that have... Or worldwide, like in cost mm -hmm. or... What The, uh, specifically in Europe, the, the boutique business operates differently. And um, the retail in Los Angeles, small retailers get sort of sucked into the large retailer's cycle of bring it in, if it doesn't sell, mark it down, get rid of it. Um, overseas, you find people a little bit more thoughtful about bringing in things slowly and, and waiting for somebody to, to purchase it and not constantly marking things down. So that, that's what I was saying about we're undergoing a, a seismic shift. If you look at what's taking the place of the brick and mortar stores, it's primarily online, online. but online mm -hmm. is, is a very small market. 
compared to uh, physical retailers. So mm -hmm. it's, it's not taking up the slack. But if you look at online, online does not discount the way a department store does. So it could be that it is changing the mindset of the consumer, but it's going, it's going to take a long time. We, we conditioned consumers to buy everything on sale. So we need to start training them to care about what they're, they're buying. Mm -hmm. I think we don't have, I mean, we have to finish, no? But, uh, yes, we have to finish, no? Yeah, we have to finish. That's it. Okay, thank you. There's one question. Uh, yeah, I, I will, we can uh, try another question and we finish. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, please. Anna. Can somebody translate for me? What would you do, what would you propose for NAFTA? For better NAFTA. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, there, are, there are two different sides that are arguing what to, how to change it. I mean, as, as everyone knows, half of the, the industry is very protectionist, and so they're arguing for um, new regulations that will protect the remaining U.S. textile industries. Um, and then there's a whole other side that is very globalist, that wants us to continue to, to operate as a global economy. I'm, I am not sure what's going to win out, to be perfectly honest. I, I am a fan of our domestic resources. Um, I think we should keep a manufacturing base. I think any, every country should have a manufacturing base mm -hmm. and be able to produce for its own um, industry. So, uh, but on the other hand, it, it's hard to deny that we receive all of our news globally. We cons we're global consumers, so uh, yeah, I can okay. argue both ways. And um, we're trying to get to the American market, which is very difficult. Actually, I, was, I, I told Alison that I was very happy to meet her because they have very strict laws. You cannot, I, I mean, I've been dragging um, my suitcase all over this country, and I understood that that is not the way to do it because they get super scared. I've been doing fairs um, that also takes like four years to get you well known, and it's very expensive for us as a small company. Uh, we're looking for a showroom, but we're, we are to ask artistry, so it's okay. <laughs> we'll keep like we'll mm -hmm. keep um, going. Okay. Just a last question. This is Steven, so we have to give him. <laughs> and <laughs> that's a very naive question, but it's my impression that there is a newfound confidence in uh, the design world, the various design worlds in Mexico right now. Uh, I don't remember reading 20 years ago about Mexican star uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, I, suddenly I see advertising for design weeks in Mexico City, yep. and I don't remember seeing, now maybe it's just I paid attention, I didn't pay attention before, but is there some kind of in both in volume and in mm -hmm. confidence going on? Yeah, there is. I mean, I personally, for example, had the chance to, to choose where to go and where to establish my architecture office because my partner is from Berlin, from Germany and Mexican. And we both chose Mexico as a place where to do architecture. And we are really happy and really excited about being there after four years of uh, establishing our company. We feel it's an open field because there's so much to do. There's so much also material to use. And there's not so many rules as in Europe. Also, we have an amazing weather. People are really available and, and, and excited to, to do things, to try things, so to work with the local craftsmanship is it's, 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 it's amazing. And um, on the other side, we're both, Christoph and I, my, my partner and I, we're both trained in Japan and in Switzerland, in England. So we come with a different eye, with a different way of doing things. So. Um, in a way for us, we're perhaps a new generation of architects who work in a global way because we are working on international competitions where we have, our network is not just in Mexico, but is, we work with 
through Skype with engineers in England, in, in Berlin, in other places, but at the same time, we work with what we have in the country. So, I mean, for me, it's been a very easy way, smooth way, somehow, and I feel that I'm a new generation of people doing architecture in this way. And although we are doing projects from Mexico, in Iraq, in, in, in China, in, in England, in, in, in Germany, we, we believe in the site-specific work. So it's not just about just being in Mexico and doing a project in Iraq, and I don't want to know about that. It's, it's, for me, it is about the region, it is about uh, understanding different cultures, but on the other side, I think this um, having a foreign eye and uh, gives you also a capacity to look at other things that maybe others don't do. So um, this is my personal experience of being in Mexico as a new generation of, of architects. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we have to finish. And thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Um, I urge you to stay in the room. We, um, I'm really good at selecting people to be on panels. I'm not so good on programming. Uh, we didn't build any breaks in. Um, and we have an extraordinary film panel coming up next, I think coming down to the stage at this moment. Cinema. And he sent me to someone who worked for him, uh, Sanford Panich, uh, who I guess now is head of Columbia Pictures. And Sanford said this remarkable thing to me, and I really want to throw it out to the panel uh, for one of the things I hope they will reflect on. He said, you know, the Anglo audience in the United States is essentially flat or in decline. It's masked a little bit by ticket prices going up. Uh, but in numbers, there's no one to grow it with. At the same time, there's an underserved uh, Latino population in the United States that the industry has not really learned how to, um, to think about and to market to. And at the same time, there is a, a, a Latin American world. He said, if we want to have an American cinema, now I'm talking about US American, it totally depends on uh, finding ways to incorporate the Latino population into, the, into that larger audience. He said, otherwise, the place of growth is China, and we'll be making films that can sell to the Chinese market, and they may well be less and less American in any, US American, in any significant way. I just want to put that out there as a question about, um, this potentially larger market that has so many population overlaps and uh, what the future is with that as you see it. But otherwise, talk about whatever you talk about. I just, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, thank you so much for being here tonight. We're the last panel, the film panel. Um, you have uh, in your program that uh, Rodrigo Garcia would uh, uh, moderate this panel, but he couldn't. Uh, sadly, he couldn't be here with us because he's sick. Um, so I'll be I'll be moderating the panel. Um, I teach at Cal Arts at the film directing program. Um, I'm a I'm a filmmaker as well, um, and I'm very happy to be um, accompanied by these three wonderful filmmakers and by Tom Rothman, who is an executive at, at Sony. Um, so I'm just, I'll, I'll introduce them very briefly and I'll let them um, then talk a little bit more about their work. Uh, Natalia is uh, a Mexican-American filmmaker who's uh, been doing nonfiction and fiction work for the past 15, 15 years. Um, She's a MacArthur uh, fellow. Um, she she just recently made a made a her first fiction film, um, 
and um, Professor Juan Mora is, is also a documentary and fiction filmmaker. He's been teaching at CUEC and CSSF for, for many years. Uh, he's been the professor of many filmmakers that have come uh, and done work here in the US. Um, Jonas is a writer-director. He uh, co-wrote Gravity with his father Alfonso and he recently released uh, The Cierto, uh, which is uh, a film with, with Gael Garcia Bernal. And uh, Tom Rothman is um, the chairman of Sony Pictures, and he, um, he basically produ produces or oversees the production and distribution of every film at Sony. So, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so welcome. And... Um, the panel, so we're going to focus a panel um, a lot on each of, of, of their work, but also on, um, how, on a lot of financing structures and, and kind of how finan financing structures work in the U.S., how, how they work in Mexico and the U.S., and in a way how in some of the work of, of, of these filmmakers, uh, they have intersected, actually. Um, so, Natalia. Yeah. Well, thank you, it's uh, lovely to be here, and thank you for inviting me. And just, uh, you know, it was really nice to walk in and see a panel full of women. <laughs> I have to say that unless I've been at a women's film festival, I have never been on a film panel with only women. <laughs> so that was really wonderful to see. And um, in thinking about what to talk about today, I thought about um, something, an experience I had when I was making my first feature documentary, Al Otro Lado, which is a film that started uh, with the idea to look at immigration and drug trafficking through corrido music. And I was filming with Los Tigres del Norte, Chalino Sanchez, um, Jenny Rivera, El Original de la Sierra. And then I wanted to film with a young, or not necessarily young, but a town composer, someone unknown, who continued the tradition of the corrido music, writing songs about people in his hometown. And I met this man, who's 23 at the time, Magdiel, and I interviewed him, and he said, well, I tried to get a visa, and I was denied, and so I'm trying to decide if I should uh, cross the border illegally or become a drug trafficker, like all my friends. So I said, okay, I'm gonna follow this guy and see what happens, right? But I'll continue making my film about music. And it took, I filmed him for about four years, um, and eventually he met a pollero, a coyote, who said, if you write a song about me, I'll take you to the other side for free. So <laughs> at that point, my film, I started to film a lot more on the border, and I was filming, I wanted to create a real portrait of what it is to cross the border. And I reached out to Chris Simcox, who later became the founder of the Minutemen, the vigilante group, which are these citizens, they're not, um, they're not border patrol, they're not uh, law enforcement, who feel that the US government has failed to patrol the border, and so they take it upon themselves to patrol the border. And I had, you know, I had, I was new to filmmaking, this is my first, time kind of out there in the world filming. And I interviewed Chris Simcox and everything was going well. And then Chris said, well, why don't you come with me patrolling this afternoon? <laughs> so I said, okay. So I got into Chris Simcox, Simcox's truck and we drove uh, to a spot about 30 miles north of the border. And um, mind you, Chris had never asked anything about me. He never said like, what's your film really about? Or whose side are you on? Or where are you from? Or anything. He just saw like little English speaking blonde me <laughs> and, you know, assumed that I was an American on his side, perhaps, or that he could have convinced me to be on his side, maybe. Um, and we started walking through the desert and he was, he, you know, walking along, pointing like, oh, look, look here, here's some footprints. These people were here last week. Here was a big group and they were here yesterday. And Here's all the trash they left behind. And it was really horrible. It was like watching someone, I come from a family of hunters, and it was like watching someone going hunting, literally. And um, I was following him in the desert, in the heat, 
and following his finger, and all of a sudden, Chris got really excited, and he said, here they are, here they are, here they are, you know, and I, I followed his finger through the lens, looking through the camera, and I saw these eyes looking out at me from a hole in the ground, and I started crying, <laughs> and they were covered with branches, you know, thorns from the desert, and they just looked like terrified animals staring out from this hole. And for me, I, I wanted to tell this story because I think it's a moment that really marked me as a filmmaker because at that moment I said, what do I do? Do I continue my job here, which is to film, to kind of be the documentarian and document and observe what's happening? Um, do I tell these people, run? Like, this isn't Border Patrol, they can't do anything to you. Like, <laughs> just run, right? What do I do? Um, so that was the first big question, which I decided to keep filming. Whether that was ethically right or wrong, I, I still don't know. Um, but that's the decision I made at the moment. And the other thing was it really put me kind of face to face with my own identity in a way that I had never had to experience as a filmmaker. And I knew at that moment that my camera was making their experience even more humiliating than it already was. Um, I knew that they would assume that I was with Chris Simcox and his group and part of, you know, these people hunting for them, which was a horrifying idea to me. Um, and then on the other side, I, I knew how Chris Simcox saw me and that the fact that I hadn't spoken in Spanish to Chris Simcox and I hadn't said that I was born in Mexico or that I was Mexican was, is what gave me access to Chris. So in the moment, if I were to get to speak to the people crossing the border, I would lose my access and my trust with Chris Simcox. So I suddenly felt really cornered, in a sense, in terms of who I was in this situation. Um, and I'm gonna show you the clip from the film. So if you could please show the video clip. It can take you three to five days to get this far north. What do you feel when you're out here seeing all this? Disgust. Absolute disgust. The human waste, knowing that this many people have broken into our country. We're a neighborhood watch group. We're out there reporting suspicious illegal activity to the proper authorities. It is a war zone. There's no other way you can describe it other than an all-out invasion. I mean, we find antibiotics, we find medicine containers. Baby stuff, look at this. I mean, look at this. Yep. This hasn't even, that must have happened today. I could take you to 50 spots like this off the side of the road. Where they sit, and they camp, and they leave all this stuff behind. They know they're going to be picked up pretty soon, so they're, they get rid of all their trash. This is pretty small compared to the other ones I've seen, where it's, you can't even see the ground. It's just covered with trash, backpacks, clothes, everything. But I guess oral hygiene is very important in Mexico because everywhere I go, there's toothpaste and toothbrushes, so they're doing one good, good thing down there. There's no doubt. These are fresh. You got a big guy here with about a size 13. See all these fresh tracks through here? These are all brand spanking. Came right here. Here they are. Here they are right here. Amigos! Como estas? Buenos dias! Cuatro amigos? Got a group sitting right here under the trees. Masters of disguise. This is Chris Simcox from Civil Homeland Defense. I got a couple of amigos here uh, hiding in the bushes uh, at Murray Springs. Uh, they're just waiting for somebody to come and get them. We got three males and one female. No, we're just sitting here with them. We found them sitting here. Just a neighborhood watch sweep. They more than anybody else does. 
It's our civic duty. The president has asked all Americans to be vigilant and to be aware of suspicious illegal activity. And you can't find any more suspicious illegal activity than finding people hiding under bushes in your backyards. All over the place. Intentaron sacar visas. Me pedían muchos requisitos. Cuenta en el banco, casa propia, todo eso. Y pues, si yo tuviera todo eso, que venía para acá, no. El gobierno de México le da lo mismo. Trabaje uno, no trabaje, de todo modo come. ¿Y usted en qué trabaja? En el campo. Same story, can't find work in Mexico, right? Looking for work here. And I wish we had a way for them to come legally and work. But no mas illegal. Y para usted la primera vez que cruza o ya había cruzado? No, la verdad intenté cruzar el, el lunes. Fue. Sí fue el lunes. ¿no? El lunes y ahora. Ah. Pero. La verdad nos sentimos derrotados. Gracias, maldito desierto. Dicen que el otro lado es bonito. Mucha gente ha ido y no ha vuelto. Uno llega y otros quedan muertos. La desgracia al maldito desierto. Las esposas se quedan sufriendo. Y sus madres quieren su regreso. Gracias a Dios. Ya está. Bueno, este, yo quiero compartir unas ideas que han guiado de cierta forma mi práctica profesional y mi práctica docente. Siento, bueno, soy profesor del CUEC, la Escuela de Cine de la UNAM, que a cierta manera ha medio invadido Hollywood <ríe> con nuestros egresados que trabajan aquí. Y, bueno, en fin, ha hecho mucho por crear un nuevo cine mexicano de base universitaria. Eh, las ideas realmente no son mías, pero son ideas que, que he hecho propias y un poco fundamento de mi trabajo. Eh, lo escribí en inglés, así que van a perdonar mi inglés. The only total freedom we have and for which we have to struggle is in Nietzsche's view, the freedom to create. My parents were artists. My mother, a sculptor, an Afro-American descended from a Madagascar slave and a white master. My father, a painter, was from Michoacán, descendant of mestizos and Purépecha Indians. I was raised as a sort of bridge between all of these cultures that coexist in me. Harold Bloom, referring to Moby Dick, states that Ishmael was the only survivor of the Pequot because he had embraced all the religions that he had encountered in his life, and thus, was protected by so, by so many gods. I believe that's an appealing thought, thought, applicable to our own lives in a multicultural world. Joseph Campbell wrote that it's apparent that during the first stages of the history of our species, there was a general centrifugal movement of peoples into distance, with the various populations becoming increasingly separated, each developing its own applications and associated interpretations of the shared universal motives and stories, myths, and religions, I would add. It seems that when a human group encountered each other, they would rather avoid them and look for a distant place to settle. In that way, humankind spread in a sort of flight from the others, from Africa to Europe, 
to the North Pole, Asia, the Oceanic Islands, and through the Bering Strait, or maybe by canoes or boats, to America. Today, since we are all now being brought together again in, in this mighty pre present period of world transport and communication, there's no place for human cultures to avoid the presence of the others. Now we have no other choice than to deal with them. I believe that making films is akin to building bridges in order to share the human experiences of different peoples. Usually, I start my classes with an idea by journalist Richard Kapuczynski regarding the encounter with the other. He reflects on his many encounters with diverse cultures and individuals during his travels as an European to Africa, Asia, and Latin America. He examines how the West has treated the non-European as an alien and a threat, from classical times to colonialism, from the age of enlightenment to today's global village. He writes that everyone we meet along the road and across the world is in a way twofold. First, there is a person, first, is a person like the rest of us who has his joys and sorrows, feels pain and suffering and good fortune. But there is also one who's a bearer of racial features and the culture, beliefs, and convictions different from ours. And we cannot separate one of the other. When I live in my country, Kapuczynski writes, I was not aware that I was a white man. And this could have significance for my fate. Only once I found myself in Africa, I was immediately informed of this by the sight of its black inhabitants. Thanks to them, I discovered my own skin color, which I never would have thought about alone. This led him to create his discourse on, on othering. First, how people distinguish the other by skin color, nationalism, and religion. Then how the encounter plays out. He stated three possibilities have always stood before man whenever he had encountered the other. He could choose war in order to annihilate him or to impose his views and beliefs. He could fence himself behind a wall denying the other's existence, or he could stop up, start up a dialogue, which is the most difficult mode of encounter because it implies understanding regarding his views and culture as valid, as truthful as ours, or even superior in some ways and thus opening a venue for cooperation. He believes that the power of the encounter begins with the individual and works up its way to the family, community, society, and finally state. The existence of the other seems to endanger the basis of the belief that we live in the best of all possible communities or societies. As their ways of doing things differently, their accomplishments and their attainment of goals that seem difficult to us can undermine our creeds and prove us wrong. But then, why should we be interested in the other? Canadian psychologist Jordan Peterson explains that if we take into account that we are social beings that need each other to survive, then the answer is obvious. The very least the other has succeeded in doing is maintaining his life and society. And when in order to accomplish something, we are in need of knowledge that we do not possess, we look to the other that has achieved it, and his experience is useful to us. Also, we realize that he has accomplished his goals by developing means different than different ours and that they are useful or even more effective. And those might rank from ways of nourishing oneself to surviving a major, a major catastrophe like terminal cancer. We want to know how he or she did it. It might even become essential to us. Hegel maintained that we could learn from ideas with his like. He was a great believer of learning from our intellectual enemies. From points of view we disagree or feel alien, bits of the truth are always scattered even in unappealing or peculiar places, and we should dig, uh, dig them out by asking what elements of sense or reason are to be contained in otherwise frightening or foreign phenomena, what underlying good idea or important need might be hiding within. He promoted the thought that really important ideas might be in the hands of people we regard at first glance as beneath contempt. One way to overcome the barriers formed by the othering is by sharing experiences through narration, through film, through art. Narrative film always deals with actions of people in pursuit of an end. How dealing with appropriate or inappropriate behaviors allows or not the attainment of essential goals. As to narrate is to describe those deeds that arise from our personal experiences of our families, friends, or acquaintances, 
or from the vast treasure of histories, fictions, myths, or even religious of human cultures, we have to be clear that in our stories we're dealing with good or bad behavior, which is the realm of ethics. For Hegel, art has a purpose. We need it so important insights can become powerful and helpful in our lives. For him, art is not the creation of novelty, but to take the really good, helpful, important thoughts that we already think we know and make them stick more imaginatively in our minds in its sensuous presentation. We all need to feel proud of where we come, where we come from, to identify ourselves with something that's important, that goes beyond our individual achievements and to anchor our identities beyond the ego, beyond the limits of our culture and views of life. We can do this through film, if we think of it as much more than mere entertainment. Maybe a con of all of these, I have chosen as the base of my work in film to reflect my cultural origins and most profound mythical roots, as you have seen on the projections of the seals of my two features to date. A thought, even a possibility, can shatter and transform us, Nietzsche. Thank you, Juan. Welcome. Thomas. Sorry. Voy a leer en inglés porque como no sabía que se podía en ambas, le pedí a mi esposa que lo trajera al inglés y ella escribe más bonito que yo, entonces... I prefer her version. When Rodrigo invited me to participate in this panel, I'd assume he invited me because of the last film I directed, Desierto, which touched on various thematics relevant to this panel. But a few, days, a few days ago, he called me and asked me that I speak of this subject matter, the subject matter of bicultural relations and the economy generated between them, but that I did that through a personal perspective. To be honest, it was, that call was a great relief. I've spent the last two years since Desierto opened in Toronto talking in different contexts about the subjects of immigration, the border, relationships between Mexico and the U.S., and while the process of writing and developing Desierto required me to read and become informed about these subject matters, there are people with more credentials on those matters. But I do feel like I have the authority necessary to talk about my own experiences. When I was 15 years old, I moved from Jalapa, a small town on the coast of Veracruz in Mexico to New York City. Obviously, it was a drastic change. I went from living with my mom and brother to living with my dad. Jalapa was a city of 400,000 people in the tropics, while New York had over 10 million residents at that time, and it snowed part of the year. But of all the changes, the most difficult was the language. Over my, overnight, my universe switched from, English to, from Spanish to English. It went from being a universe under my control to one that could be frightening at times. I remember well American history in 10th grade, where the teacher always made us read out loud. That class terrified me. The idea of reading out loud in a language I was still learning sent me... Ah, sorry. Uh, saying I read too loud, which I was never reading out, good out loud. <laughs> well, I remember uh, American history where the teacher always would make it, made us read out loud, and you know, I was very terrified, and all my classmate picked up on that fear. So every time the teacher would ask, who wants to read out loud, the whole class would answer in chorus, ho oh, nas, ho oh, nas, ho oh, nas. I survived high school, and three years later, later, I met my wife at college. Attending high school in a foreign language is difficult, but it wasn't until I began living with Aaron that I understood the complexities, volatilities, and difficult difficulties of a bicultural relationship. Relationships are never easy. Two people, each with their own neuroses, having to learn to coexist. If you add to that different languages, different cultures, different prejudices, there will obviously be bumps in the road. In our case, it's my wife who truly deserves the credit, not only for having the patience to deal with me, but also because when we met, I'd already lived in the US for three years. The trauma of learning English only lasted for my first year of high school, and by, the, and by college, all, of that, all that was left was my thick accent. For Erin, it was much different. She only spoke English and had never visited Mexico. It's never easy to meet your parents in love, but much worse when you don't understand a word they're, they're saying. <laughs> 
It's also important to note that our relationship began in the context of Bush's presidency and the war on Iraq, which had awoken an anti-gringo sentiment all over the world. Within that setting, Aaron had to meet my whole family, which wasn't easy. Aaron survived the two terms of Bush, and by the time Obama was elected and the world recovered its hope in the US, she spoke flawless Spanish and our first son, Camilo, had been born. Unlike his parents, Camilo spoke both Spanish and English by the time he was five. He had the tools necessary to avoid the horrors his parents underwent in learning second languages. But then I enrolled him in the French Lycée. <laughs> and the process of attending a Francophone school has been a challenge for him, but who had truly suffered are Aaron and I, having to begin French classes just to keep up with him. <laughs> My maternal mother is, grandmother is French, and I'm the only one in the family who didn't learn French. My accent is terrible, but hopefully soon through the process of learning with my son, I'll be able to speak to her. Elia, the youngest of my son, is quicker with languages than the rest of us and hasn't struggled so much in the lycée. The other day, I asked Camilo what language he wants to learn after French. Without thinking twice, he responded, none. Three is enough. <laughs> Thank you, Jonas. Say two. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I don't speak Spanish, but I do speak French. Um, I have no idea what I'm doing up on this panel, none whatsoever, except that it's a great honor to be in the company of such great artists um, whom I respect and admire. Um, my story is very different, uh, but uh, the only thing that it's made me think as I sit here, and I won't take much time because I think perhaps the best thing is to answer questions people may have um, about the international film business. But as I sat here, I was thinking, obviously, um, the subject of your work and your lives <coughs> is uh, obviously touches closely to immigration as it affects the community of mankind. And, um, you know, I think the thing that is perhaps most forgotten, uh, but I will bring this back around to film in the end, is that we are all, all of us uh, immigrants at some point or another. So uh, my great-grandfather, uh, my great-grandparents actually on both sides fled the pogroms um, in uh, Western Russia, uh, Jewish immigrants uh, to America three generations ago. Um, and I married a, uh, a descendant of the Mayflower. Um, I'm not sure she knew what she was getting into, but um, so... <clears throat> The, there is a universality that goes with that, and I think one of the things that I've discovered in a life of over 30 years in the, in the, in the film business is that uh, the cliche is true, film is a universal language. Um, it does transcend uh, boundaries, um, and uh, that is true whatever its specificity is. I have worked on films that um, are related to this. I, when I ran Searchlight, um, oversaw a film called La Misma Luna, um, quite relevant to today's subject matters. And uh, interestingly, um, just today in Tijuana, uh, my company starts uh, principal photography on a remake of a Mexican film called Miss Bala that is being made for, we hope, uh, primarily um, the Hispanic audience, but not only so. It's being made largely in English with Gina Rodriguez. Um, and um, in an effort to, uh, A, make a great story, but B, try to um, as a, um, as a, actually a 
strategic effort to try to have programming for the growing um, Hispanic audiences in America. Um, and then obviously eventually in the rest of the world as well. But what, what, what I have learned working on films um, of all shapes and sizes, I have worked on uh, in my time the least probably expensive movies uh, ever widely distributed. I worked on a movie that cost less than $20,000 and was eventually widely distributed all around the world and the most expensive movie. I worked on a movie that cost over $400 million. Um, I've worked on the uh, two highest grossing movies in the history of film and I've worked on films that I'm incredibly proud of that with the exception of people related to me and myself, nobody ever saw. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I guess what I would say is that the greatest and most enduring films achieve a certain universality, a relatability that comes from a universal recognition of emotional commonality. And yet, the very best ones do it with tremendous cultural specificity. And so whether that specific experience is the, um, the, 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 from, um, as, 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 speci as specific as that excerpt from your film there, those individuals on both sides of that dilemma um, there, or, I mean, I've, I worked on Slumdog Millionaire, which is, you would think, greatly specific to India or the Full Monty, you know, specific to Scotland or train spotting, specific to, to, from great specificity comes true universality. Um, and uh, I, I think that is cause for actual great optimism in a world where it's hard to find optimism. Um, and I think uh, movies can really um, be a very positive force in the world um, for making different cultures understand each other um, and for building on the basic commonality and fellowship of, of man. So, um, you know, that that's really what, what, what's, what comes to my mind as I listen to these three uh, great artists who I'm very privileged to sit next to. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. So in order to find um, kind of a common um, subject for all of us, um, I would like to come back to you, Natalia, and talk about your you create your your process of creating the films that you've been that you've been making for the past years within the context of um, of financing. How's that how has that worked for you through the years? And you being a filmmaker that um, has lived in the U.S. and Mexico uh, for for these many years, and and kind of um, you've been shooting in Mexico, but you've been getting a lot of financing from the U.S. through different institutions, either public or private. Yeah. Sure. So I've made uh, three feature documentaries, and I just made my first fiction feature um, called Todo lo demás, Everything Else, with Adriana Barraza. Um, and so my experience is basically, my, this, this clip you saw was from a film that I made in 2005, and it was my first feature, and it looked at immigration, and sort of uh, was financed, it was financed entirely in the United States, mostly by public television, which is the largest funder of independent documentaries in the US. Um, I tried, I think, to get some money in Mexico, but I just, I didn't have any experience, and I just couldn't do it. I think I applied for one grant. They require a lot of paperwork, and it didn't happen. Um, I think it was a film that in some regards, I mean, I could tell you some stories, but um, I would pitch the project. I would say, you know, I'm making a film about corrido music in Sinaloa. 
right? And, no, and it was like, well, what's that? Like, no <laughs> one knew what corridos were. No one knew what Sinaloa was. And I said, but the Tigres del Norte are in it. <laughs> Uh, you, you mean in Mexico? No, in the States. Oh, okay, okay, in the States, yeah. <laughs> in the States, and it was like, what do you mean you don't know who Los Tigres del Norte are? Like, <laughs> you know, so, so you definitely came up against a lot of resistance. And then on the other hand, I was dealing with a subject matter that was in the news at the time. So it was also topical, which makes it a lot easier uh, to raise money. And what I was trying to do at the time was to look at immigration from the Mexican perspective, because there were other films that looked at what is life like for Mexicans living in the US, there was a great film called Farmingville that had just come out that kind of looked at um, immigrant experience. Uh, then I made El General, which is a film about my great grandfather who was president of Mexico in the 20s. And that was another situation because he founded the PRI, which was a political party that was in power for about 70 years. And um, it was not a PRI government when I was making the film. And so I just couldn't raise money in Mexico because of the political context content in my film. And I was raising money in the States, again, through public television. And in that case, the challenge was very different because it was a personal story. So it was narrated mostly by audio recordings that my grandmother had made. And there again, it was a kind of, you know, who, who cares about this Mexican president no one's ever heard of, right? Which, as a Mexican, you can see, like, what do you mean you've never heard of the PRI and Calles and the Mexican Revolution, right? How's that possible? But so I ran up against a whole different set of uh, struggles trying to find out. Also a personal film that's all told from women. You know, was uh, something we run up against a lot, I think, is this feeling that we're not really, um, our stories aren't, aren't validated. We don't have kind of the right to tell our own narratives. And if the narrative isn't part of kind of the mainstream political situation of the moment, then it's probably not worth telling. Um, and then I made El Velador, which again, I tried to raise money for in Mexico, but I couldn't because um, Mexican grants that come through the government all get published. They're public, everybody knows about it. And it was a film that was shot in a cemetery in the north of Mexico where a lot of the big drug dealers are buried. And I had been threatened and it was very dangerous to be shooting there. So I didn't need it to be public that I was making the film. Uh, so in that case, I raised money in the States. And then, to my surprise, which was great, is making a fiction film, uh, I found a huge difference. So in the US, fiction films tend to be funded by investors. And there's very little money for financing a fiction film in the US that's foundation-based, grant-based. You can get a little bit of money to write a script, maybe, but you're not going to get enough money, enough money to actually shoot a fiction film. Mexico, however, so let me, ex in Mexico, we have this wonderful new grant called Eficine, which is a tax incentive for companies to give money to film productions. And there's, that's why we have so many films coming out of Mexico now is because there's actually a lot of government money. The fact that it comes from the government means that the way that films are evaluated isn't solely based on their box office potential. So you can have an auteur film made in Mexico and not worry that you're never going to be able to pay back the investment. In the States, for as much as there is independent film, someone doesn't really want to give money to something that they don't think they're never going to see their money back. So even in the most independent American films, ultimately, there's this, you know, the goal and the final measure tends to be the box office. Like, did it make its money back? Did the investors make any money? And that means that you make certain kinds of films. And I feel like in Mexico, while you can talk about um, other issues that come up when you have government funding, whether there's uh, any kind of censorship happening or restrictions in terms of content, um, we, I believe that we actually have a lot more freedom to make uh, different, weird films and to be much more, take many more risks and be more daring in our filmmaking because of how the financing works. No? Was, uh, was that your experience, Jonas, with Desierto? No, in the case of Desierto particularly, you know, it was when I wrote the script since I, it was five years ago, I was living in the US and I tried to finance the film through private investing, but I came to the roadblock that is a movie where the American was the villain and he was killing Mexicans, so obviously it wasn't a very investor-friendly film. And, and so also in general, because of the subject matter, it was easier to raise in Mexico, but I do see 
with my film, but with many other films that in Mexico, when you apply for Eficina, you do have that freedom she's, Natalie is talking about in the sense that like, you don't need to be always creatively thinking about packaging and like, oh, mm -hmm. what star am I gonna get for the film? And is it in, in what language, you know? Like there's many points in the Sierra that I remember certain investors asked me like, oh, why don't you turn Gael's character, the immigrant, into a character that speaks English that will like obviously widen, widen our market. And obviously, thanks to Eficina, you don't have to make those decisions. And, and Juan, you have, you know, you've been through different stages of Mexican cinema. You've seen, um, you've been making films since what year? What, when was your first film? documentaries in 75. 75, I mean, this, the, the stages and the evolution of the Mexican film industry has been very drastic, in, if, even in, within decades, right? How, can you well, talk? Well, when, when, when I start teaching at Quick, one of the things I used to say to my students, I, I said, there's no Mexican film, it doesn't exist. There were the Fichera films, mm -hmm. you know, about prostitutes and nightclubs and even asking a girl to the movie was, you would, she would slap your face because it was like... That was a perception. A decent proposition, okay. going to the movies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I told them, we have to invent Mexican film. And they did it, which is a beautiful thing. And I don't know, in my case, I avoided the language problem by shooting my films in original Nahuatl, mm -hmm. the Aztec tongue, <laughs> then in Purepecha, indigenous uh, language from Michoacán. <laughs> And, but now I'm forced to shoot in Spanish and in English, mm. which is a good thing, uh, honoring both of my origins. And I was, I don't know, doing films was, dif was very difficult, very, very difficult. And my first project, I was very much interested in doing a film based on Mexican culture. When I was studying in Prague, I found out the Greek tragedy was born out of the critique of the, myth, of the Greek myth. And I thought then Mexican drama should be born from the critique of Mexican myth. So I tried to do something in that sense. It came out like a bad Greek drama. And I said, <laughs> well, Mexican myths are not the same. So I had to immerse myself in the study of pre-Columbian mythology and came out with this script about the Aztecs went to the producers and they said, Aztecs? Who's interested in Aztecs? Why don't you do something that have, can happen in Mexico, New York, or Paris? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, no, I don't think I'm gonna get any help from here. So I applied for a Guggenheim Fellowship, I got it. That enabled me to, give, to write the script and they gave me some, a little bit of a name in order to get some support from the Mexican film uh, governmental institutions. And I, they gave me the bud, half of the budget they would give any other film. But I shot my film in Nahuatl. I had many problems with it, you know, because when you shoot a film in a di language different Spanish, you have, you have to pay in dollars because it's supposed to be an export film. So when we were dubbing the film, the union, actors' union came and stopped my, my work mm -hmm. and demanded I should pay in dollars. But one of the, because I was shooting in a foreign language. But one of the actors went to the press, and the next day I went to speak with the leaders of the actors' union, and they threw a newspaper at me that said, the, the actors' union thinks that now what is a foreign language. And they told me, well, you pay whatever you want to pay. So it has been little roadblocks that I have been able to, to break little by little. And, and one question that I that I had for you specifically was, what's your you know, what do you attribute to this rise um, of of Mexican cinema in terms of you know in terms of production? Of course, there's an easy answer, which is there's more funds, right? But you know, through the decades, what ha, ha, have you seen a change that goes beyond just? Uh, a financing structure from the government? Well, I would say uh, film schools, basically, because as nobody was able to make a film, we all had to develop ways of making films. 
So most of my students became not only directors or cinematographers, but producers. So the way to do a film in Mexico, you have an idea, you become the producer, you shoot the film the way you want to shoot it, because you raise the money yourself, and then you get into the problem of distribution, which is something we haven't mastered yet. I think nobody has mastered that yet. <laughs> and you have to uh, get into a very unfair competition with, with the big distribution <laughs> companies that rule the world. Yeah. But <laughs> it's possible to go in other ways. I know my film of the Aztecs, well, it was very successful here in, in L.A. At, a, at the American Cinematheque. They had a little show with Mexican film. I was sitting with Moctezuma Sparza, whose eyes were opening widely and wide and widely. Then he said, Juan, we owe you an apology. We sent people to Mexico to get this kind of films. They didn't show them to us. So we want to make a dinner for you. And the next day in the, in the Los Angeles Times came a very beautiful critique by Kevin Thomas saying that my film was a wonderful film. And I got a call from Roger Corman said that he wanted to distribute it. But it didn't happen. <laughs> you know? Then I took the film, I don't know, to Yugoslavia. At the time, it was Yugoslavia. I showed the film to an audience, and after the show was ended, everybody was very silent. Nobody would leave the room, the projection room, but they wouldn't ask anything. So after a moment, I said, what's going on? I said, well, you made us live through a mythical experience, and you expect us to talk. <laughs> and I say, how can the pre-Columbian myths touch the souls of these Europeans? Mm. which were in the midst of a war. So this film has survived up today. I still get people asking me to go to festivals with a film. It paid itself back. I didn't make money, but the film is there. And after that film, it was easier for me to make another project and another project. I don't know. I think that you have to make films that there's a need to be made. I don't know if I'm saying it correctly. And I think that our students, well, they don't have the pressure to go into commercial films. Uh, well, it's, many times they think it's impossible to, for them to go into commercial films, and they talk about things that they, they're really interested in. And those themes are the ones that people are really interested in. So that's the way this, I don't, I don't call it an industry. It's not an industry. The only industry in Mexico is television. Uh, it, it, I don't know, they're films made with a soul. That's what's going on. Thank you. Um, so, uh, you know, I remember when, when, I was, when I was growing up, when I was uh, a kid in the 90s, I, you know, there were, there were most, when we thought about Mexican filmmakers, it felt like a lot of them, or most of them, wanted to either come to the US or go to Europe to make films. Um, and, there's there's been a clear shift. There's there's been a clear change where um, a lot of us are either staying or f if we live in a different country, we we come back and make and and make our films in Mexico. And um, earlier, Natalia, you were talking about this idea. You know, talking about um, how we can kind of continue or 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 move forward or create new ideas around um, what's happening in Mexico in terms of financing. You, we were talking kind of about films that have been made both with um, Eficina, which is this, this tax incentive, and then that have kind of a back, backup of uh, US studios. In the case of your film, Conas, it, it wasn't that way in production, but you got kind of major distribution for an independent film, right? Um, can you talk about how was this, that experience uh, with you know having basically working with with both uh, with both countries? Well, in your case, with three, but you know, can yeah. you? Yeah. Well, you know, in the process of this year, though, I did realize you know it was my first feature film and. When you're like racing your movie, you're always 
your only concern, at least I was always told your concern should be to get the money to make the film. And obviously I was very grateful to get the funding partly through IMCINE, the Mexican Film Institute, but also through a private investor, Alex Garcia, who mm. bridge financed, and there was French, uh, the CNSA in France also. And Al Alex Garcia is based here in LA, yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly, he's yeah. in LA. Bobo, he's Mexican, and yeah. back then his company was in Mexico, so he was investing as a Mexican producer. But I guess what I'm getting at is in the process, I realized that one thing is getting your film made, and nowadays with so much private investing, it's, it's and with technology making, making it cheaper to make your film, in, in a way, one problem is getting your movie made, but then a bigger problem, which I realized once I was done with Desierto, is getting your movie seen. And so obviously in Desierto, I was lucky to get accepted into Toronto and in the premiere in Toronto the movie played well and and I was able to secure a deal with STX in the US but then so I guess I mean to your question I the movie itself was financed as a Mexican production but I did experience what a studio release was in the US and I, I wouldn't know what to say about it yet it was my only experience and it was in my opinion, the way it was released, it was very targeted towards a Mexican audience in the US, but what I learned is that they're very, the Mexican audience is treated as a separate market than the mainstream market, so I understand that that's part of the reality of the market, but I, in my opinion, I don't know if that's the way films should be released. I, I think that's a really interesting subject because, you know, um, when we talk about this idea of topicality, right, and who, like, I was, I, I showed one of my films recently at the Mexican consulate, and they, someone asked me, like, what, you know, what is it to be a Mexican filmmaker, right? And I think that, that, that question is posed a lot to, to filmmakers that come from Mexico, South America, Asia, not a lot for American filmmakers, right? It's like, kind of like, if you're American, you're kind of, a universal filmmaker, but if you're um, Mexican, you can only make certain type of films. Could you? I, I'm sorry, I don't agree with that at all. I think that's a very narrow view of it. I mean, I'm bo running both ways. Um, Hollywood has always been ho Hollywood as a as a place is is irrelevant as a place. It's only relevant as an industry for that, and there's never been, ever, an industry in the history of the world more welcoming of voices uh, from, from distant cultures. Hollywood was built on, uh, this is like you, you go down the list from, you know, Billy Wilder on. Um, it's, a, it's a largely immigrant-based um, uh, history uh, for, of, of filmmaking, and then, you have the reverse is also true, which is, believe me, there are many people ask Spike Lee every day whether his films will translate to the world market. That's not particular for Mexican filmmakers or, or Latin American filmmakers or Russian filmmakers or French filmmakers. It's not true. What, what is the case is there is uh, uh, um, historically a... Uh, in America, a relatively limited, because it's, because it's extremely upscale and requires a level of education, um, and uh, it's, it's limited socioeconomically for uh, subtitled foreign language films. And that, that is a different, that's a different kettle of fish. And when you, when you, when you have a subtitled foreign language film playing in theaters, Difficult to book that in mainstream theaters. Now, that's about to change radically. It's about to change entirely, and for the next generation of audience, it will look nothing like what it looked like for me because over-the-top services and digital distribution will enable the long tail, and so any uh, uh, the breadth of distribution of foreign language films will expand, not in movie theaters. 
N not in movie theaters, no. But on your on individual platforms. devices and over the top platforms, yes. So distribution will become much more egalitarian, extremely uh, democratized, but it will not look like what everyone thinks of. I run one of the few companies, probably the only company, that on a systematic basis, Sony Classics, releases foreign language films um, in theaters in the United States. Uh, and we've won, I would say, th three out of the last five foreign language Oscars. And um, I can tell you, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's nearly impossible economically. Uh, but what is going to happen is, it's very ironic, because when I was growing up and, you know, learning the language of film, it was very much, if you were a film geek, it was very much an international process, right? Because uh, f f French films and German films and especially Italian films, um, uh, and to a a lesser degree, but to some extent, Mexican films as well, were distributed commercially in movie theaters. High-end movie theaters, but that's what art, art theaters were called, the landmark, and the whole circuits dedicated to that. That is no longer a sustainable economic model because of how much it costs. Uh, marketing has gotten way too expensive, but it's about to flip over the other way, mm. which is you're about to now have the ability to distribute foreign language films instantly and, um, and incredibly economically, simultaneously, to all over the country. Um, and then it will just be a question of, of gaining attention and the audience's awareness, which is a challenge. Uh, so we're going to... No, 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 we're going to take some questions after... No, I just want to go back to the point of Emcine and creative freedom, because I, I guess what I'm trying to say about what bothered me about the release, and I don't blame the distributor, obviously the main market was the Hispanic market far out in LA, and that's where the movie... The, the only places, the only cinemas were based on research the movie had a chance to play. I guess what I'm getting at is, and that's always an issue when you turn art into an industry, which is at what point you start making creative decisions just because it's what sells, so what? Now is Mexican cinema always gonna have to be family comedies because that's what we're seeing plays very well? Or is Mexican and Latin American cinema only gonna have to portray drug lord violence in a Scarface glorifying it way and turning it in, into entertainment because yeah, we see, we see with so many TV shows that that's clearly what's selling, but when you are only focused on the industry side of things, I do think that like you start losing honesty, you start losing cultural idiosyncrasic because Mexicans were not all drug lords, there's many other parts so, of the Mexican so, narrative. So I guess that's always my concern with... Well, so I, I, I actually, things. after 35 years in the industry, I can answer that question, actually. And that is that if you try to make something because you think that's what the industry wants and that that's what's quote-unquote commercial, you will fail. So it's as simple as that. So I can tell you the answer is make what's in your heart, make what you think you believe in, follow your passion, and, and the audience will come with you or not. But calculation absolutely and categorically and emphatically does not work. Um, so, and I can, I can tell you that from, from uh, you know, just years of, of experience that makes sense only in retrospect. Some of the least commercial uh, most autoristic films in existence I have financed. I financed a film about a kid, an Indian, an unknown, unknown, no actor, nobody, a 13-year-old Indian boy in a boat where his parents died and drowned in front of him with a tiger, stuck in a boat for months at sea, 
with nothing happening except the tiger getting seasick, <laughs> and in the end, and everybody dying, and in the end, uh, the tiger walks off and leaves him without so much as a look back. Okay, and that was a movie called The Life of Pi. And would you and finance it, ended, it if it hadn't been a bestseller already before the... It's a very legitimate question. <laughs> Probably with that filmmaker, I would have. So would, the real question is, would I finance it without Ang Lee? <laughs> yeah. And the answer is no. Um, but that's because... That, the, the, and that's, the, that's the, the privilege that comes from... A guy working. It was the sixth film I've made with, 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 with Ang Lee. And you, you, the filmmakers, as risk increase, they earn the right to, or the likelihood of being able to get uh, greater risk. And that was a, that was an insane risk. It made no sense whatsoever. But I can tell you this: there was no constrict. There was no way that I could spin that or pitch that or pretend that there was anything <laughs> quote unquote commercial about that. It was insane. But he believed in it and I believed in him, right? Um, you, you, you guys know how hard it was for you to get gravity made. Uh, there, w the, 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 the answer that I've won one, two, three, four, five uh, Best Picture Oscars, and uh, every one of them was deemed to be impossibly uncommercial. Impossibly uncommercial. What are you, out of your mind? About a slum Tom, million? Tom, sorry, sorry, thank you. I have to uh, stop okay, you a little sorry. bit. Um, we Never have, mind. Yeah, we, yeah. Forget all that. <laughs> Just all I would say is, it isn't true. Don't try to calculate. Just do what we you have, believe sorry, in, sorry, so we have and it'll work out. Five minutes for questions. Okay. Um, I'm done. I was very quiet this whole panel. <laughs> Stephen. It's going to be great. Well, yes and no. So, so, the, so the comment is about uh, new ways, new ways of distribution, and how the, that will help, kind of. Here, here's the problem. Steve. And it's sorry. It's not. It's not. Uh, distribution is, as we speak, no longer the problem. Any, you have instant distribution. I could distrib I could distribute your film right now. Here by uploading it. So distribute and anybody here, most people, not everybody, but have some kind of device, even if it's a crummy smartphone or you know halfway decent television that you can upload to. The distribution is not the problem. The problem is 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 marketing and awareness, and that's the okay. that is that's the great uh, that that remains a great uh, economic impediment. Another question. Oh, there are many questions up there in red. Gracias. <laughs> they ran out of batteries. Oh, they ran out of batteries. The beautiful sound. I think so. The sound of the absence of batteries.
So this is very relevant, right? Because it's it's about uh, about NAFTA and how that that actually limits not the films that as Mexican as Mexican filmmakers or producers we bring to the U.S., but actually the amount of films that we show in Mexico, right, as comparison to the to the to the U.S. films that are shown in in uh, in, Me in Mexico in or in nuestras salas de cine, no? Sí, claro. Yeah, gracias. Okay. Una, gracias, gracias. Uh, another question there. Should I repeat the question? Was that to me? Yeah. yeah. I'm not sure I understood it. It's just basically it was if you believe that in the new negotiations of NAFTA, there should be a cap on the amount of American films in Mexico. No, I don't believe that. But um, but I do believe that um, that local film is extremely important and that actually, the relatively speaking, to where it's been, in some period of time, I think actually the local, um, local commercially driven uh, cinema in Mexico is relatively healthy. I think that that um, what I can tell you is that um, caps don't work. Uh, so if you take a market that has a uh, a quota, which would be China. Um, a very, very strict quote on American film, the amount, they try to regulate the box office, they try to control the actual ratio of domestic box office to international box office. Um, it, it, it simply doesn't work because the, what we were talking about before, films are seen in different ways now anyway, and if, the, if people want to see a film in the world today, they're going to see it. I think a better version, ironically, and maybe closer to what you're talking about in Mexico, is what you'll see in France. Um, uh, France, which has an extremely consistently year, uh, over many, many years, a very healthy um, uh, uh, local film industry. And what happens in France is, it's not protectionist in the sense that there are no quotas on how many films that can come in, but there is a great deal of state support um, uh, for filmmaking and a great deal of, um, I guess you would say, um, bias in the system of, of um, uh, the, the, the largest um, uh, ancillary companies uh, in terms of the support that needs to go to the local industry. So I think that the best model for uh, growing industries, that's better. It's ironic because, and I think it was you were referring to it earlier, it absolutely does not exist in America. So I'm, <laughs> I'm on the uh, board of advisor for the National Endowment for the Arts May it soon rest in peace. And um, not a job that, not a job with a long lifeline ahead of it, but uh, I have it for the moment. And uh, that's the only state uh, institutional um, uh, arts funded organization in the entire country. There are local state organizations, but they get half of their money from the National Endowment of the Arts. And, the amount of individual 
the funding for individual uh, filmmaking is it's it's negligible to the point of non-existent. It's it's less than the than the smallest fraction in the smallest Latin American country. So you we we ha so here in America we have only a commercial industry, right? And then in the documentary world you will have television supported but it's all aspects of a of a mm -hmm. of a commercial industry particularly for narrative film in in a in a market like mexico where there is very understandable frustration i'm sure for mexican filmmakers with the respect to the domination of the box office of american films which i think is what the question probably was referring mm -hmm. to um, i honestly think you can't stop it and that it's not a function of NAFTA or no NAFTA or that, because the 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 we, we are we are too close in neighbors. But what I do believe would be extremely healthy, um, and ultimately our argument at the NEA is that it's actually jobs job positive and job promoting, is to have really good uh, state support for um, for local filmmaking. Um, and, and you can produce a great deal of talent. Uh, same thing happened, for example, in Australia. Long period of state so support we, there. We've, we've, we're a bit over time, so I, just, I would just like to hear from one of you Sorry. thoughts around this. Yeah. I mean, I think it's important considering the distribution aspect that, yes, there's a, we can't, like, my film, for example, is not going to compete with a big Hollywood film in theaters in Mexico. Like, that's impossible. But what I was saying earlier is that I don't have to, in a sense. I want to get my film made. I want people to see it, of course. I hope it's in theaters. And we have the Cineteca Nacional, and there's a lot of festivals. But at least, in terms of my financing, my film won't be considered a failure because it didn't make it in the box office. That's at least how I feel about it. Do, in do terms you think of the financing, because I don't have to pay anybody back. So it makes a big difference. Do you think? Um do you think of ways that that can, could be applied in the US in a way through like actually Mexican financing? Oh, well, it's because we were talking, yeah, we were talking about that. Because <laughs> that, um, I live half and half, half in Mexico and half in the US. And I am close to a Latino film community in the US that I feel like nobody knows about in Mexico. Um, and I have this fantasy of being able to support um, Chicano and Latino filmmakers who are making films in the US, often about Mexico or about their experience, through Eficine and providing a kind of base for them to do production, to, you know, we have great sound, you know, sound mixing studios, color correction places. So I would love to see a kind of reverse flow of money <laughs> so that as Mexicans, we're not always looking at how are we gonna get our money from the US or how are we gonna get money from Europe? And something I found very interesting is when you go to a festival, for example, and you have to declare the nationality of your film, it's based on the financing of your film. So, for example, my three documentaries are all technically American films, even if they weren't filmed in the US, even if everyone worked on the film was Mexican, because the financing came from the States. And it's a form of, I think, appropriation of our work that isn't, uh, it's incorrect, it's wrong. Um, so my kind of fantasy is that we could somehow reverse that flow and create more of a relationship between the Latinos making films in the US and Mexicans. And it's complicated because they're very different uh, demographics in a sense, I think. Thank you, Natalia. Do, do we need to finish? Well, there are two different distribution scenarios. So one is how the film gets distributed in Mexico and the US. And for documentaries, I, th I feel like I hit a kind of turning point or I was kind of when things are shifting. Because I started making films when 
the main distribution for my kind of films is PBS, television, and then the educational market, where indeed you would buy a university or cultural center will buy a DVD for $300 or so because they're buying exhibition rights. But when I started, there was no Netflix or streaming or any of these very cheap or even Amazon to buy a DVD for $20. So there was the home market and then there was the educational market. And for documentaries, the educational market was always a better place. And I feel very fortunate to have gone to that market because I feel that it's very important to have academics writing about the kinds of films I make and for my films to exist in a dialogue with other films and in the kind of academic discourse. Um, my films in Mexico haven't had, my documentaries haven't had distribution in terms of DVD for many different reasons. Um, the latest being that I was threatened to making El Velador and so it felt too risky to distribute the film. Someone put it up on YouTube. I'm delighted, I hope people watch it. It doesn't affect me that, in that way. Um, but they're separate. So you have your US distributors and your Mexican distributors. Um, Thank you. Ok, eh, pues ya tenemos que terminar. Muchísimas gracias a los panelistas y gracias por quedarse más tiempo. I would like to add my thanks to the panel. Uh, for me, it has been a quite inspiring day. You sort of wonder, with the amount of brilliance gathered here, how could the world end up so screwed up? <laughs> it seems like we ought to be doing better than we are. Ah, well. Um, but Thank you very much. Uh, we'll continue tomorrow starting at 10.30 in the morning uh, with uh, coffee in the lobby uh, starting at 9.30. I hope many of you will come back. And uh, I thank all the participants today and all the staff who have helped deliver this event. Good evening. Thank you.